the compensation structure has moved from a system where as our productivity increases, we all get a greater piece of the pie, to as our productivity increases, the CEOs, the corporations in Wall Street get a greater and greater piece of the pie, while wages in this country have remained flat for average workers and have ha actually been in decline since 2003. In addition, the jobs generated by this economy are more and more low-paying service sector jobs. When I was a kid growing up in the mid-70s in Portland, Oregon, we were able to purchase a home for two-thirds of my father's salary as a steel worker. My husband and I in Twist, Washington, now purchase a home almost the same size, 70s style split level, for eight times the combined salary of both of us. Same size home, it, there's not a place in this country where an average wage earner can purchase a home for one year of their salary. So the, the wages in this country have been going down so that the profits can go up. We don't have a trickle-down economy, we have a gush-up economy, and it's basically draining the wealth from the working and middle class of the nation to feed to that top 1%. 80% of the jobs generated in our economy, back when our economy generated jobs, were low-income service sector jobs that did not allow a family to meet basic needs. In fact, over 29 million people in this country work full-time in jobs that pay below minimum wage, or be below poverty level. And in the Pacific Northwest, 40% of the jobs would allow two parents working full-time to meet the basic needs of their two kids, which means that 60% of the jobs generated would not. So our wage and compensation structure has slowly been forced down, paying people less and less and less as our productivity is going up, but all of that profit is going up to the top people in Wall Street, the CEOs, and the banks. At the same time, our tax structure has experienced the same kind of flip-flop, back from the Eisenhower years where wealth was taxed at the 90% rate, to now where <laughs> our tax system levies the poor, the middle class, and even the upper middle class to subsidize the rich. <coughs> Capital gains is taxed at the 15% rate, while Americans, average American workers pay 25% in income tax and 50% payroll taxes. Changes in the tax code under the Clinton administration reduced the tax burden for the 400 top taxpayers by 16%, while increasing the tax burden for everyone else by 18%. And the Bush tax cuts overwhelmingly benefited the wealthy at the cost of the rest of us. These are just two examples of how wealth is flowing up in our nation. At the same time, the basic re regulations on businesses that have protected American consumers since the Great Depression were also being gutted. Savings and loan banks were deregulated in the 80s under the Reagan administration, resulting in the failure of 2,400 U.S. thrifts at the cost of $560 billion. Most of it were paid by us, the U.S. taxpayer. And the Clinton administration in 1999 repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, which was first passed in Congress in 1933 to mandate the separation and conflict of interest from commercial banking and investment funds. So, it should be no surprise. Yes. It should be no surprise. Yeah, L Lauren Summers. Thank you, Lauren Summers. It should be no surprise, now that these regulations have been taken away, that we once again see the same kind of conflicts of interest that created the collapse in the Great Depression. We are basically mimicking a similar set of scenarios and setting ourselves up for the exact same fall. Finally, in 2003, Congress removed the regulations requiring financial institutions to hold a reasonable amount of capital, limiting how much leverage trading they can do. Banks and financial institutions can now take one dollar of capital and basically gamble it in leverage trades up to 40 times its worth. What they are gambling on are high yield, high risk, unregulated mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, and other risky derivatives. What they are gambling with are investments from people like you in your college savings, your pension funds, your 401ks, and any other investments that you had in the stock market. They took your money, and they gambled it, and they lost. This is how the wealth of the nation has been allowed to flow from the working class people and the middle class people and even the upper middle class people of this nation up to the very top 1% of the financial elite who now 
pull the strings and call the shots with our government officials in Washington, D.C. So, what can we do about it? In the long term, I outline a whole host of policy prescriptions intended to recalibrate our economy so that the wealth of our nation that has been allowed to consolidate at the very top is forced back down and to circulate throughout the rest of the economy. The problem with wealth consolidation are many, but one is that wealth that is staying at the very top of our economy is not wealth that is circulating throughout it in the form of wages and consumptions that we need to drive the entire economic system. It's simply wealth at the very top looking for more investment opportunities, which our banking community was more than happy to give them using your money. However, we should heed the words of Simon Johnson in The Quiet Coup, who warns us that the economic recovery will fail unless we break the financial oligarchy that is blocking essential reform. And if we are to prevent a true depression, frankly, we are running out of time. Therefore, one of the first things we can do is demand that our elected officials nationalize these banks, these large, insolvent banks, because if they are too big to fail, they are too big to exist. If we temporarily nationalize these banks, we can protect taxpayer dollars, we can get credit flowing again so that homes can be purchased and small businesses can grow, and we can then fire the financial CEOs and boards and break the control that these wealthy oligarchs have over our nation's economy and our people. Thomas Jefferson once said, I believe that the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberty than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issuance of their currency, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until they wake up, with, with, until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their fathers conquered. And that is exactly the situation that we are in today. What I describe in Plan B is that we are currently in a standoff between taxpayers of this country and their children and the financial elite that are controlling the nation with Congress and the President uncomfortably in the middle. They must choose between helping the wealthy oligarchs that cause our current problems or helping average Americans whose spending can help resolve them as our democracy hangs in the balance. We must demand that our elected officials restore the balance of power in our nation and put the needs of our nation's people first. Nationalizing these large failing banks is an excellent first step. Yes, 10 of them are giving back their TARP money or some of their TARP money and asking to get out of their TARP obligations, not because they are solvent. Remember, they still have over $170 trillion of toxic assets on their books. But why? Because their CEOs want to get those big pay packages again. So for me, the issue is not over. These banks, at some point, as defaults grow, credit card defaults and home foreclosures grow, will be back with their hands out, asking for more money. And at that point, I hope that a new way forward has enough momentum that our nation's leaders will listen and nationalize these banks so we can restore some balance to our economy. Please sign the petitions. It is something that you can do. Please read Plan B and send it to your friends and send it to your representatives and tell them that it is time to put our nation's people first. And thank you so much for coming out today. Yeah.